Let's pick up where we left off. Chris has just finished talking about how Shanann is the one who wanted to name this their son Nico, that it had nothing to do with NK. Because remember, the mistress's name was Nicole Lee, spelled N-I-C-H-O-L. So Coder was asking, you know, did the name Nico have anything to do with her? And Chris is saying, no, you know, Shanann liked that name. It was an Italian name. And Lee was the middle name from, you know, my middle name because his name is Chris Lee. And he kind of had talked about how the girls' names were decided as well. So in this <clears throat> part, we're going to hear Baumhauer ask about what Chris did upon entering the house on the morning of August 13th. And from here on out in these videos, I'm going to add pictures and some videos in the background to give you guys something to look at while you watch. So let's get started. So, and like, she did leave for, you know, my middle name and my dad and all that, but like, Nico is like, that's the name that she always liked. Did she name all the kids? She named Bella and so on? Yeah, Bella, because the Italian means beautiful, Marie. Mom's middle name, Celeste is her grandmother's name, Catherine's Shannon's middle name. Did you have any input in their names? I just told them I liked them. I was like, I was like, if we have, oh, like, if we had a third child, you know, I was gonna, maybe we could have like Lee in the middle name, but you know, like, you know, I knew like the girls' names. It was, you know, I love those names, so I was like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Especially like with the, you know, you have little nicknames for them, you know, like Bell and Bella Dean and CC, obviously. So. Good, but yeah, Nico was, yeah, okay. Can we go back to the house on the 13th? So, um, at one point, right when you got back there, and Coonrod was there, Officer Coonrod and Nicole was there. Mm -hmm. and then okay, so remember on August 13th, that is when Officer Coonrod showed up at the home after. Nicole Atkinson, Shanann's friend, called the police for a welfare a welfare check on Shanann. So Bob Haver is going to kind of ask, you know, what Chris did when he got to the house, and um, Chris gives an explanation that doesn't totally add up to what we see in the body cam. So let's listen. You went in the house in here for about a minute or so before you let everybody in. Remember what you were doing in there at that time? No, I was. So I went into the garage, right, and then I ran around and I opened the front door. Yeah, opened the front door for did everybody come in through the garage or the front door. Everybody came through the front door. Yeah, so I came in, I went in through there, I came in, opened the front door, and I ran upstairs. I just was like, like I was looking around. Okay, was that that's after everybody? Did you go around the house at all before you opened the front door? No, uh, I, didn't, I didn't run around. I stayed down the bottom, okay. the bottom floor, and then yeah. ran open. Okay, so remember, Shanann's phone was found in the upstairs loft area couch, cushions. Her phone was found by Nicole Atkinson's son. So a lot of people speculate that he had the phone when he arrived home and that he ran upstairs and stashed it into the, the cushions before coming down to open the door and let everyone else in. But here, Chris is saying during that minute that he was alone in the house, he did not go upstairs. He claims he went in through the garage and just kind of ran around the house to the front door and let everyone in. So if you believe that Chris did not go upstairs, then we have to believe that the phone was stuck under the cushions by somebody, you know, before he got home, that he did not have the phone when he arrived home. In the door? Yeah, okay. That's true. And I ran upstairs and everybody else, and that's when Nicole's, Nicole's son mm -hmm. was on the phone. And so right there, Chris says, I opened the door, that's when I ran upstairs and Nicole's son found the phone. Well, when watching the camera, he opens the door and does not run upstairs. He goes into the kitchen and is kind of on his, looking at his cell phone, and then the next thing he does is heads towards the basement and said he was letting Dieter out. I was going for a second, like I was walking through the 
house. Yeah. She didn't have her bra on. Was that normal that she would sleep in her bra? Mm. Every once in a while. I mean, she just got home from the plane, so she didn't even take off her her makeup or anything. Maybe she was just that tired. But normally, only no. Did it not come off when you guys had sex? No. I don't think so. Sometimes she just, you know, just keeps her shirt on and she just. So, this is so sad, but remember, Shanann was found wearing a bra, a shirt, and a blue thong type underwear. The shirt she was wearing was different than the shirt that we see her arriving home in on their doorbell footage. So Tammy was asking, like, you know, what about her still having the bra on? Did it not come off when you guys had sex? And his answer to me sounds kind of vague. He doesn't say, oh, you know, she left the bra on when we had sex that night. Or, yeah, yeah, it, she always wears her bra to bed. It was just, he just said, I don't think so. So it just, again, like, it makes me question, did they have sex that night? She doesn't want me to do anything. Just like, she wants what she wants. <laughs> she knew what she wanted. That's what she wanted. And again, I know that a lot of women do sleep in their bras, wear their bras when they have sex. Like, I'm not questioning that. I'm just questioning Chris's vague response to that question. Like, he just didn't seem very sure on all that, in my opinion. Okay, right here, Tammy is going to answer a question for Chris. She says, so when you guys had sex, was it just the missionary position? And quick, Chris quickly says, yep. In my opinion, she should have said, when you guys had sex, what position did you have sex in? So that Chris would have to come up with his own answer rather than being supplied the answer from Tammy. Just missionary sex? Yep. I'm going to go back real quick. And when she... When she, her final resting place, was that just naturally what she was wearing? You didn't change her or anything like that? Okay. Did not come off when you guys had sex? No? I don't think so. Sometimes she just, you know, just keeps her shirt on and she doesn't want me to do anything. Just like, she wants what she wants. <laughs> <laughs> she knew what she wanted. That's what she wanted. Was it just missionary sex? Yep. So there it was. Was it just missionary sex? Chris says, yep. Like, it's like she supplied that answer completely. He didn't have to come up with an answer. He now, um, Co yeah, Coder is going to ask about what she was found in. Is that what she was naturally wearing? You didn't change her or anything. So if we believe Chris did not change her shirt, that would mean... Shanann went upstairs, which I do believe Shanann went upstairs because of the step count on her phone. Shows her climb the flight of stairs around 1.50 a.m. that morning. So, if Chris didn't change her, we must believe she went upstairs and at least changed her shirt. When she was her final resting place, was that just naturally what she was wearing? You didn't change her or anything like that? Okay. Did you have to see any of that stuff? Pictures or anything? No. I asked not to. Okay. They said I could. I was like, no, I don't want. I've, I've prayed for those hazmat workers that I'm, I'm sure it was hazmat, right? To have the you were part of it. Yeah. yeah. And like, we were all there. We were all there. I'm sorry. Guys, yeah, I never wanted to see that. I, I prayed. So there they were talking about the autopsy pictures and everything and um, the bodies and. He says, you know, I never wanted to see any of that. And they're saying how we had to see it. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, it's just, Chris is just so odd to me. I was rather have to be there. I, I don't, I don't, never wanted to know what, what the aftermath was. They, they, they said, like, you know, if they ever got, ever got, like, a preliminary, preliminary hearing, that I, I would have to see him just to be prepared. 
and not have a reaction, an initial or an initial reaction. But I was like, I don't want to. See Do you feel like your lawyers were fair to you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were all. I mean, they were my only human contact, really. Yeah. So they're they're kind of like almost like a guidance counselor, almost. Yeah. Did you feel like you were driving the bus though? With your decisions, you yeah, made? Yeah, I was like, I, you know, there was a lot of things I didn't really know what was going on behind. See, so they're asking, you know, about his decision to make the guilty plea. And he does say, yeah, I feel like I was driving the bus. But then on the other hand, he says there were a lot of things I didn't know that were going on behind the scenes. So, you know, was he kept in the dark about certain evidence? You know, I, we know Cindy talks about she feels she was left in the dark. So, I don't know. This is interesting to me just to kind of hear how Chris talks about his attorneys. Um, it seems like sure. maybe there's a lot of things they never told me. Like, you know, um, like stuff that came out like afterwards, like the whole Nicole, Nikki Kessinger article and Denver Post and all that kind of stuff. They told me like afterwards and everything, but it was, I always felt like anything I was telling them, they were, they were, they were going to do. Like the whole. So right there, he brings up NK's Denver Post article. Now, this is an interview she did with the Denver Post, basically saying, I had no idea he was married. He lied to me about everything. When in reality, yeah, Chris probably lied to her about some things, but she was looking at their Facebook. She Googled their names in 2017 before she claimed to know them. I mean, just a lot of things about NK don't make her seem as innocent as this Denver Post article did. And Chris is saying, you know, he didn't see that article until afterwards. And in my opinion, I almost, you know, I wish they would have showed him that article and said, hey, you know, are the things NK is, um, are the things NK is saying, are they true? And who knows? I mean, that could have made him feel anger at her for throwing him under the bus so much and lying when, you know, he knew the truth or whatever. I mean, they both lie. I understand that. I'm just saying I wish they would have, you know, shown him that article and who knows, maybe he would have turned against her or the outcome could have been different. Well, taking the plea deal and everything, I told them that's what I wanted to do and they, you know, they, they asked me like, seems like a hundred times, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure? Like, once you sign this, like, um, I guess I, I, up until sentencing, I had the time to, like, you know, back out. But, like, they always, even before we walked in the court, I'm like, are you sure? So, yeah, this is, this is it. Like, okay. They, ne they never told me this is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. so, they always just said, this is your decision. You know, like, if you want to take this farther, we're, you know, and John said he, he was ready. He had all kinds of motions written, all kinds of stuff that were like really creative, and because he'd never been in something like this before, and he was ready to fight. So right there, he talks about how his attorney had never been in something like this before. So remember, Chris only had public defenders, and you know maybe they were a little bit inexperienced, and the DA was telling them certain things. And they went with it. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, we are in America. I feel like every single person has the right to a fair trial. I feel like it is the state's job to present proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this case, you know, Chris pled, yes, Chris said, I did this all. But the evidence... We are, you know, two, two years later almost, and the evidence still does not totally add up to any of Chris's versions. I was just like, I, I didn't want you to have to do that. Not for me, not for, not for something that the story isn't, or isn't true. Because mm -hmm. it, it was just only gotten worse mm -hmm. for everybody. 
for all three of you, for everybody that was involved in it. Are you still glad you did? Yeah, I mean... So he says it would have just gotten worse for you guys, everybody that was involved in it. I mean, yeah, you could say he only met his family and his friends and Shanann's family and Shanann's friends. Or you can question for everybody that was involved in it. Was that a slip? Does he mean everybody that may have been involved in the crime? Because if this had gone to trial and Chris did not plead, plead guilty, so much more evidence would have come out. I never, I never thought I'd be in prison the rest of my life, but like I, I he says he never thought he would be in prison for the rest of his life. I mean, you know, like if you know you murdered your pregnant wife and your two children, common sense is going to tell you you're going to be in prison for the rest of your life. So to me, like, that just makes me wonder, like, maybe he did not do this all by himself and he felt like other people would have had more charges. I don't know. But ultimately, you know, he pled guilty, so he is in prison for the rest of his life. I don't want people to have to keep going through this every day of their lives, knowing that, you know, there's a trial hanging over their head or, I mean, if it ever got that far, I don't know. Yeah. But, like, I didn't want people to have to relive it yeah, every day. Yeah. Did they have to ever see the pictures? Say that again. Did they have to ever see the pictures? Frank and Sandy and all that? No. No, they never saw it. They saw some things. They didn't, they didn't see anything of that. Okay. Yeah. We shielded that from them. That's one thing. I just didn't want them to have to see anything or hear anybody talk about what anything or any part of it. Or like, you know, any anybody bastard daughter, you know? Like anybody ruined, like, you know, to hear what, you know, some of my friends had a negative, you know, impact on her from her or like had a description of her that didn't that they didn't, that didn't match, you know, something like that. I didn't want them to hear that either, but like, I didn't want them like, you know anybody have to trash her memory. Like I wanted like them to know like she was, you know, she's a loving wife, she's beautiful, she always helped everybody else, all her friends, her Lucas friends, everybody. So right there, Chris is saying another thing with, you know, drawing this out into a trial. He didn't want anyone to trash Shanann's memory. She was a beautiful, loving wife, um, would always help anybody. You know, that frustrates me because, like, Chris trashed her memory in a way by saying that she killed the kids. And in my opinion, you know, I'm open to that thought. I'm open in crimes to any thought. I just don't see the evidence of that. You know, the way that statement came about was after Tammy gave it to him. I personally don't see the evidence of it. Um, but he definitely, you know, caused people to believe that by saying it. And another thing I took away from this little part is when talking about Shanann, he's talking about she was beautiful, she was loving, a good mom. And remember when asked about NK, he immediately says she would get worked up over the smallest things. I had to talk her off a ledge, you know, things like that. So I just found it interesting to hear kind of like what he said about NK versus Shanann. I just want, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to take away what she did. I tried to get you to say that that night. I know. I know, I know. But, um, do you remember that? I remember. I was just like, I know you obviously weren't ready to say I, that. I, I, I know. It's like, you know, like after my dad left, we both came in and like, all right, we got most of the story. Let's get to the, the true story. I'm just like, I just wanted to bang my head against the table. But in the end, I think you did the right thing. And even though it's hard to hear, um, there's a lot of people who thank you for what you did. I think your whole life has been thinking of others except for one brief moment, you know. I think you really did think of others when you made that choice. So I personally thank you, right? Because it, it would have been hard for the three of us to go through about this hard and for everyone else about that hard, right? Yeah, it was anybody that was family or friends. Right. It been, you know, just exponentially harder for everybody. Yeah. I think you did right thing. So you haven't told your parents what happened, you just told them I'm pleading guilty for a reason? Yeah, I've told them, like, on the phone, even, because they, they're still, I don't know. They, you they, should fight it, you should... <laughs> uh, they've, they've got letters from, like, Australia, from England, I mean, 
of like the 35C in Colorado and stuff, like you know, improper counsel or something or like that. Effective counsel. Mm-hmm. Effective counsel. And um, I mean, some of the stuff they, you know, you know, they said about you know the dry patch, how it's not like FDA approved, how it can alter somebody's mind, like. So right there, they kind of talked about his parents and how, you know, when he did plead guilty, all they had heard was the version that Shanann killed the girls and then he killed Shanann. That's all they were told at that point. And like I said before, you know, Cindy did make statements kind of feeling like she was left in the dark, that she was denied contact to Chris, things like that. And, you know, I can understand as a mom, you love your children unconditionally. Her and Shanann, and, you know, never got along well. And so her son saying this happened, she's in a state of shock. Like, you know, I don't want to fault her for feeling like that. I don't, again, I don't think Shanann did it, but when you want to believe your child and you're in shock, I can understand at first kind of, you know, maybe believing that. Um, uh, like, uh, there was some kind of condition but there's some else they call like CPSD complex uh, post traumatic stress disorder, or something like that. Have been like some people from England have had it. It's like uh, they've been in an emotionally abusive relationship and stuff like that. I mean, just like you know, some of the some of the little subjects they put in there, like yeah, I can relate to it, but like it doesn't make up for the fact what happened. But like they've they've, they've got a lot of support. From, they've got a lot of hate mail, a lot of phone calls, a lot of like you know, you know stuff like that. I wish they never happened. But they, you know, they, they get some support, which is good. But on the phone, they still think, you know, there's a chance that I could get out. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to ever think your kid's going away forever. Like, they, I mean, they, they don't want to fathom it. They tell me to fight it, like, you know, you know they don't, not every day, but in their, on their bad days. Yeah. So Chris is saying, you know, he's so... Um, His family still thinks there's a chance that he could get out and still tell him to fight it. And again, you know, if this was my family member, I would be wanting more answers. I would want to know why NK Googled the family in 2017. Why she Googled Shanann in January 2018. I would want to know whose gray truck was parked outside. I would want to know more about the basement. I would want to know why in Kay's phone pinged the morning of the murders in Frederick when that was not usual. Why didn't she call Chris or Chris call her that morning like their routine was? You know, what time did NK clock into work? What was NK's demeanor on August 13th? Where was Jim during all this? Where was NK during all this? You know, as Chris's mother or family member or Shanann's mom or family member, personally, I would be searching for more answers. They'll get a bad message or a bad letter and then I'll just come her back. Is that more your mom or your dad? My mom. She loses it a lot. Yeah. On the phone, my dad's usually trying to, you know, like, hey, don't talk about this stuff. I'm on the phone with him. Because it's just gonna rile, it's gonna rile you up, and it's gonna make him go back to his cell, and he's gonna just kind of think about that all night. Right. And that as that happens a lot. Yeah. Would you ever want him to know what you're telling us today? I'd rather just tell them myself. Yeah. So they're coming. I think they're gonna try to make a visit in like May or so. So they don't. Do they still think that Shanann killed the girl? They still believe that, even though I told them I play guilty for a reason, but they think that I was, their, their words, like, railroaded by the legal team. Because they, you know, they felt like I, they, they pressured me to do it. So, you know, remember, again, when Chris pled, all his family knew was his original statement that Shanann killed the girls. And at this point, he's saying they still believe she may have killed the girls and felt like he was possibly railroaded into pleading guilty to all counts. Do you feel like that? No. 
Yeah. No, they, they asked me plenty of times. This is like, you know, they want they wanted to fight. Like, they were, if I said fight, they would have just, you know, yeah. gone and... Found their gloves. Yeah. Just went yeah. in there and did it. You know? Yeah. It's like, no, I just, I can't have you do that. So, Chris, you care about others deeply. I can tell. You worry about others. Um, and I've asked you, you know, a bunch of times today, but... You're not just telling us that you did it because you feel bad for Shanann's memory. You did it. Okay. I have to say, like, you know, after this. So, Crowder's like, you're not just saying you did it because you feel bad for Shanann's memory. You did it. And you don't hear a response. I'm guessing he nodded his head. Yes. Um, he's like, okay. Like, it just seems like even the you know, law enforcement is still kind of like having questions and they still have to know that this does not all add up. It was all over, you know, people would bring up like, oh my gosh, I bet you're going to find out that Chris, you know, used to torture animals and, you know, all this stuff. You could imagine, like, you know, hearing that someone's capable of that, what have they done in their past, those kinds of things. Can you think back to your past at all, like your childhood, and think about any other moments that maybe you felt the same rage, I mean obviously didn't do anything like that, but maybe felt that rage and like what would have triggered that or anything like that. Mm, not really, I mean I was always like somebody that tried to coax people down, not to like if somebody wanted to fight somebody else. I didn't get in a fight like when I was in third grade, but it was like, you know, we ripped each other's shirt, when do I cry? Mm -hmm. You know, it was like stupid. Mm -hmm. I was just like, why did I, why did I do that? And like maybe... That was like my only like bad thing I did in school. <laughs> so I can't think of Did you that. feel it on the inside whether you didn't act it out? Like did you feel like like if someone bullied you at school or if someone whatever, like would it still be inside you? Like did you feel like that even though you didn't actually act on it? Oh please, because I was always, you know, I never really talked to many people. So I never I mean people knew who I was, but they didn't really I mean, I never really spoke to many people. That's why I never had a girlfriend in high school. I mean I was always so here Chris is, you know, kind of talking about his past and saying he was always the one to kind of calm people down. And that kind of goes back to what he said with NK, you know, that he would have to talk her off a ledge, things like that. Um, he said he didn't really talk to many people, things like that. And again, that also goes back to the relationship with NK. In my opinion, and based on the evidence and the words I've heard, it looks like she's the one who pursued him. She's the one who, you know, was wanting to hang out or brought up hanging out after they got back from San Diego. In Chris's own words, talking about meeting her, he says, she left me alone for a couple of days. When you look at their call logs, she initiates contact much more than he does. Kind of like just fly under the radar. Did you feel like you had low self esteem? Honestly, low self esteem. It was just like I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be part of like a group or a clique. I just like you know. I had a couple friends. And sat at a lunch table with them, and or sat out. In, they call it like the fish pond area, and you know, just chilled out there. And I didn't really want a whole lot of friends. Just kind of like just close knit. And I just wasn't out there. I mean, you know, like I said, people knew who I was, but it wasn't. Out of, like it was popular or anything. Mm -hmm. Can you attribute that to anything in your childhood? Why you were no, like my that? sister was always the, the popular one. Uh -huh. She was more like my mom, like more like outgoing and like me and my grandma would always sit outside in middle school waiting for her to come out and pick her up and she'd always be the last one out. She'd talk to everybody and all and my grandma would always like, Where is she at? Does she know we waiting? But you know, it's I was just the opposite of her. Mm -hmm. And I was like Sometimes you have kids that are like the same, and some of you have opposite. Me and my sister are completely opposite. Maybe I just drew on that, that I didn't want to be the popular one. I wanted to be just, you know, just a regular, regular guy. Mm -hmm. So but there was not really like bullying or not like I remember. Nobody ever really came up to me or wanted to fight me or. Never got made fun of, never. No, I mean, I was. I, mean, I had braces and I had like a bowl cut for a while. And I guess it could have made it fun. Most kids that. did. 90s, <laughs> 80s and 90s were cool. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, a Jim Carrey cut with a bowl on your head. Just, yeah. Yeah. Them around. But yeah, it was, I don't think there was anything that would 
and you know, it would be pent up inside me from, from childhood. childhood. I know you talked about your dad having an addiction when I was talking to you. That was after I. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. They just kind of wrapped up his childhood. Chris says, you know, I had a pretty normal childhood. I never was bullied or, you know, gotten a couple fights, but, or I got in a fight in third grade. But nothing, you know, big. He was just kind of talking about how he was quiet in his childhood and things like that. So, um, in the next part, they're going to talk about Ronnie Watts, which is Chris Watts' father and his um, drug problems after Chris left home. So, we'll stop there. Thank you for watching.